Thank you very much uh, for the inv invitation to talk. I think, I think you've given most of my speech already, Sorry. as, as you've done, <laughs> but I'll, uh, all right, what I've been asked to um, talk about is the classic trial, but not just about the classic trial, but uh, main, uh, about the sort of wider uh, implications of it, um, and to give a flavor of, of what a clinical trial can actually uh, deliver, not just in the short term, uh, but in, in the longer term. So by way of background, laparoscopic colorectal surgery was introduced in the 1990s. Uh, it was introduced on a sort of ticket um, that followed uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy, and there was this concerns about technical safeties, and there was a lot of unsurety and a lot of uh, controversy surrounding it. It became even more controversial when people started to use it uh, for malignancy um, towards the end of the late 1990s. And real concerns about, you know, technically, was this a sensible and safe thing to do? In oncological surgery, were we actually still doing a, a proper cancer operation? And also, any new technology is more expensive. Can we actually justify it um, in terms of, uh, of costs? And it was against that background, really, that we needed some, some vehicle um, to perform a, a rigorous evaluation. And, and, and that was classic. So classic was designed... Uh, to compare safety and efficacy of laparoscopic versus the standard at that time, uh, open, uh, uh, open surgery, and this was uh, for cancers. Um, we weren't the only people thinking this way. There were other clinical trials being set up at the same time. So uh, in particular, uh, the NIH uh, study in the US, the COST study, and there were other smaller studies. There was one in Singapore. So simultaneous trials trying to answer these uh, same questions. But Classic was unique because it was the only one of um, the trials to actually include rectal cancer. And Secondly, we, we had the advantage of Phil Quirk and, and a centralized uh, pathological review of all the specimens, which the other trials really didn't have. So at that time, this was the current NICE guidance when Classic was uh, going on. And, Classic, and NICE in 2000 said for laparoscopic, for, sorry, for colorectal cancer, open rather than laparoscopic resections should be the preferred surgical procedure. That sounds Kind of bizarre, doesn't it? We're only 13 years on from there, but a very strong statement from NICE, really. And that statement actually played into our hands uh, running the trial because it meant that if you wanted to do laparoscopic surgery, then what you had to do was do it as part of a randomized controlled trial. The only one there was was classic. So that was, that, that was great. That did uh, help us. So classic was funded by the Medical Research Council, uh, 800,000 there or thereabouts, slightly less, I think, um, which in today's money would be considered pretty cheap for a big multi-center uh, study. It was coordinated from Leeds. Um, Pierre Guy was the PI for, for the study, and recruitment was for six years. Um, it was supposed to be for five. It was extended for uh, another year. So uh, the end of recruitment was 2002. And it accrued 794 patients across 28 centers, I think about 35 surgeons in the UK. And it was deliberately designed to get the most information from the laparoscopic arm, so there was a two-to-one bias in the uh, randomization. Short-term results, actually you were right, John, it's 2005, uh, <laughs> reported in The Lancet in 2005. And what, what they showed essentially was that laparoscopic and open surgery were, were similar. Complication rates were similar between the two arms. The mortality was similar. There was a slight reduction um, in, in, in length of stay in the laparoscopic arm. Um, we have to bear in mind that we also had rectal cancers uh, in, in, in this study. And the pathological outcomes, the lymph nodes, yields, etc., uh, the short-term surrogate markers of onco oncological adequacy were similar. But there were concerns. There was a high conversion rate, so overall 29%, and for the rectums, 34%. So that, that in today's standards, that, that, you know, a third of patients being converted. There were also oncological issues with the, the upper rectal cancers, the anterior resections. So we had a CRM positivity rate in our laparoscopic arm of 12% as compared to 6% for open. So, uh, an, an obvious concern, it wasn't statistically uh, significant, um, but it is worrying. 
The other things we, we, we drew attention to was uh, male sexual function, which appeared to be uh, worse following laparoscopic surgery than, uh, than open. We looked at the health economics, and we looked at both the direct and, and indirect costs. In terms of um, the direct costs, um, the uh, uh, theater costs, because the operations were taken slightly longer, the lap costs were higher, the non-theater costs, because patients were going home slightly earlier, was slightly cheaper. Rectal cancer obviously was more expensive than colon cancer, but overall, there was no real difference. It was a couple of hundred pounds either way uh, between the two techniques. The longer-term survival at five years, there was no difference between the laparoscopic or open arms in overall survival or, indeed, uh, in disease-free survival. And these were important figures when, when these came out um, because of that higher positivity, CRM positivity in the upper rectal cancers that we reported earlier. We were very keen to look at the local recurrence rates at five years. And what we found was that there was actually no difference between the lap and, 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 and open arms. So that was very reassuring. And similarly for the APRs, the rates uh, were similar, not stati statistically different. The one thing uh, that we did find, when we analyzed the data, not on an intention to treat, but a actual procedure uh, basis, then we got these survival curves. So the open survival curve is shown here in black, the laparoscopic in red, and those people who are converted from a laparoscopic to open in green. And there is a statistical difference between these, these curves. So if you are converted, you do have a worse overall survival, and these curves actually digress very early on. So within the first 30 days thereafter, they run fairly parallel. So there is something going on in converted patients that was having a worse outcome. That takes us up to 2006, when the second NICE guidance um, uh, was brought out. And here we see an absolute sea change in attitude. So the NICE guidance in 2006 is now laparoscopic resection is recommended as an alternative to, uh, to open surgery. So a complete set change. But it did come with, with various caveats, and that, that was that the surgeons um, should have completed adequate training, and they should be doing enough of these procedures to maintain competence. So the implications of NICE uh, were that lap was laparoscopic uh, colorectal surgery became a standard of care. There was an obligation on healthcare providers to make it normally available. And to help uh, facilitate this, the tariff was increased. So there was an uplift on the tariff to cover the consumables of the of the laparoscopic approach, and a big emphasis uh, on uh, the need for adequate training. So if we look at the immediate outputs of Classic, I, I think here are the uh, 10 papers that have been published. Uh, number 11 is probably going to be the final one on complications and quality of life. That's just been submitted and hopefully uh, accepted. So we've covered things like the cost uh, of the procedures, um, bladder and sexual function, the short-term results, factors influencing conversions, adhesion and incisional hernias, longer-term follow-up. We've looked at how trial data compares to cancer repositories, et cetera, et cetera. So an, an enormous quantity of, of academic output has actually come uh, from this uh, trial and data set. <clears throat> to try and, and put the impact of Classic into some perspective, I, I've divided it into sort of national and international uh, impacts. So if we look at, at, at national impacts, and if we look at what maybe Classic did in terms of um, in national guidance and, and service delivery, there's no doubt it was a vehicle for the safe implementation of laparoscopic surgery. There was that statement by NICE saying that all laparoscopic surgeons have to be done within the trial. And Classic provided that environment where surgeons could do it, they could talk to each other, they could do it in a safe way. And that was very reassuring, I think, when bringing in this new technology. The fact that you weren't out there, the sole operator, doing a new uh, uh, procedure. There's no doubt that, 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 that Classic played a part in, in helping to change that NICE guidance. It was only one of 
uh, seven uh, RCTs included, and it was the only one to include rectal cancer. A positive statement from NICE did help to change attitudes of surgeons. It did help to change the attitudes of healthcare providers and this concept of making laparoscopic surgery normally available. It demonstrated the potential efficiency and cost savings in terms of reduction of bed stays. And it helped society at large by getting people up and about much quicker. There was an impact on policy and uh, Mark's going to talk about the, the LAPCO program. But Classic did, the results of Classic and NICE uh, subsequently did provoke the Department of Health to set up um, this national training program, adequately funded 20 million pounds of investment. That was almost unprecedented really at the time, specifically aiming at increasing the adoption of laparoscopic colorectal surgery. In terms of impact for practice and patients, we've talked about laparoscopic becoming standard of care. We've seen the penetration of laparoscopic surgery rise from 10% in 2009 to up to 40% in 2012. And a lot of credit is, is, is due to the LAPCO program. So we've got a very common disease, 40,000 patients diagnosed each year, and potentially 80% of these resections can be done laparoscopically. So the impact for patients is huge. It's also been embraced within the, the National Institute for Innovation and Improvement as a central theme uh, for en enhanced recovery. If we look on the bigger scale, the international uh, arena, um, a classic, it did help to inform the design and setups of other studies. So the, the US NIHR, the James Fleshman study, very much used some of the concepts in, in classic, particularly the pathological centralized review in the design of that study. And similarly, color too also drew inspiration uh, from classic. It helped to resolve some of these uh, controversies in laparoscopic surgery. We had this Barcelona outlier effect. They reported better outcomes in stage two colorectal cancer. And a meta-analysis done internationally resolved that and showed the Barcelona data to be the outlier uh, that it was. And it's been cited in various international policies. So the US 2012 policy statement on laparoscopic colorectal cancer surgery refers to classics and its findings. It's also had an impact on research and innovation. Our next study what we'd like to think of as the son of classic, and it's a robotics trial called ROLAR. So it's taking the same sort of uh, uh, ideology, taking a new technology, but rigorously evaluating it. It is a pan-world collaboration. It has to be because of the number of robots in use. But it, again, is addressing very important questions regarding safety, efficacy, patient benefits, and cost effectiveness. So we're gonna look at uh, 400 patient uh, recruitment, randomized one-to-one, -one, laparoscopic or open. We're gonna look at technical endpoints such as conversion, oncological endpoints, obviously it's a cancer trial, functional outcomes, quality of life, and very importantly, health economics. So we currently have about 20 sites uh, open to recruitment, six sites in the UK, uh, other sites in Italy, um, Germany, France, goes all the way to South Korea, Singapore, and then back over to the States. We're opening up another 17 sites uh, shortly in the next six months. So to date, we've recruited 170 patients. We need 400. We estimate on current uh, recruitment that we will achieve that by September 2014. As with most uh, studies, surgical trials, they start off very, very slow and you get very depressed and despondent. This is never gonna work. And suddenly they just kick in. You get a critical number of centers participating and bang, the recruitment goes. So April has been our best month to date. Um, this uh, chart can be updated. We've had 25 patients recruited just in April. So to summarize, classic, um, has had an impact on many different spheres. It's um, improved patient outcomes, it has influenced healthcare policy, it has informed other international clinical studies, and it's been the catalyst for further innovation and research. When we look back at that 800,000 pound investment by the MRC in 1996, we've had 10 years of impact from Classic, and from where I'm standing, I believe that's money well spent. Thank you very much.